everybody. I'm Gerald Moss, Director of Georgia College's Leadership Program. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to our Hussery Forum on Leadership, uh, where our topic is Media Literacy and the Future of Democracy. Before we uh, go any further, I must say that this forum is being recorded. By participating in this program, you are consenting to being recorded. If you prefer to view the recording instead of participating, please leave this meeting and email leadership.programs at gcsu.edu. I'd also ask uh, that our guests wear masks. We have additional masks available on the back table. If you'd like a mask, you can go back there and get one or raise your hand and we will bring you a mask. But I do ask that, um, you, uh, that we do wear masks. We're delighted to welcome um, our three guests to Georgia College to speak in our Us3 Forum on Leadership. Richard Griffiths, Vice President and Senior Editorial Director, recently retired from CNN. Greg Bluestein, political reporter with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And Rose Scott, host and executive producer at WABE Atlanta, who uh, is up on the screen uh, here. Um, Amida <laughs> Ramakrishnan will introduce our distinguished guests momentarily, but allow me uh, briefly to say a few words about this event. The Usri Forum is named for uh, the former U.S. Secretary of Labor, uh, Bill Usri. Um, the forum has a goal of uh, exploring leadership that brings people together, spanning divides and spanning, uh, bridging divides and spanning boundaries and of finding value in diverse new perspectives. Secretary Ussery, across his career, did precisely that, working to solve challenges at home and abroad and to build meaningful relationships around the world. This series is made possible by a generous gift from Melvin and Lisa Ussery, to whom we express our continuing gratitude. Likewise, we acknowledge our co-sponsors, the American Democracy Project, um, and the Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges, COPLAC. I also want to thank my colleagues, Anika Ramakrishnan, our W.J. Usri Jr. Fellow, and Dr. James Schiffman, my colleague who is Associate Professor of Communication at Georgia College. Uh, both Anika and Dr. Schiffman will be moderating this afternoon's discussion. Today's conversation, as I said, is about media literacy and the future of democracy. And we're hosting this important discussion during Constitution Week. It was 234 years and four days ago that the delegates at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia signed the US Constitution. In honor of Constitution Week, we have a small gift for each of you on your chairs, a copy of the US Constitution. And it's the First Amendment to that document which states that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. As we sit here this evening, there are brave men and women in every corner of the world working to bring you the truth, no matter how hard it is uh, to find. And it is that First Amendment that is the first and best defense, just as it is our last best chance for preserving and deepening American democracy. To that end, I want to remind all Georgia College students, faculty, and staff that Georgia College provides for you a free, unlimited subscription to the New York Times. You'll see instructions for how to access that on the back of your Constitution. There's a QR code, and there's also a URL that you can follow. It's very simple to set up your access. You can read it on online. You can also download the app on your phone or your tablet and read the New York Times at any point. Um, so I encourage you to do that, and I hope that what we discuss here this afternoon will really make you excited to, uh, to download, uh, download that app and become a regular reader of, of the New York Times or your, your favorite, uh, favorite news outlet. Um, with that said, um, I want to thank you again for being here. I'll now ask that Ms. Ramakrishnan introduce our three panelists. Good evening. Joining us tonight for our forum is Richard Griffiths. He is a retired journalist and frequent lecturer on journalism, ethics, and investigative journalism. 
He is a Stembler Distinguished Professional in Residence in the School of Media and Journalism at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and is an industry fellow with the Cox Institute for Journalism Innovation, Management, and Leadership in the Grady College of Journalism at the University of Georgia. He is also President Emeritus of Georgia First Amendment Foundation. For 25 years, he worked at CNN, ending his time there as Vice President and Senior Editorial Director. Next, joining us on Zoom is Rose Scott. Rose Scott is an award-winning journalist and host of the midday news program, Closer Look, heard on Atlanta's NPR station, 90.1 FM, WABE. She has interviewed foreign heads of states, cabinet members, U.S. ambassadors, and foreign diplomats, state and local elected officials, as well as civic and social leaders. Well-respected in the Atlanta community for her thought-provoking reporting style, Ms. Scott has been honored with several awards, including a Southeast Regional Emmy Award, and a, an Edward R. Murrow Award, Atlanta Association of Black Journalists Award, and numerous Georgia Association of Broadcaster Awards. Greg Bluestein is a political reporter who covers the governor's office and state politics for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He joined the newspaper in June 2012 after spending seven years with the Atlanta Bureau of the Associated Press, where he covered a range of beats that included political and legal affairs. He also contributes to the AJC Political Insider blog. An alumnus of the University of Georgia's Grady College of Journalism, Mr. Bluestein has received the John E. Drury Young Alumni Award. He currently is writing a book, How the Peach State Turned Purple, about the 2020 Georgia elections. Please join me in welcoming our guests for tonight. Okay, so I'll get started with the first question. Uh, each of you relies primarily on a different medium. Richard, you built your career in television news. And radio. And radio. Rose, we hear you on the radio. And Greg, you're primarily a writer. You've worked for the Associated Press and now Atlanta Journal-Constitution. So I'd like each of you to speak about your medium, what you enjoy about it, and how you engage your viewers, listeners, readers uh, with, with uh, what you do. So let's start with Rose, if we could. Thank you, and I hope you all can hear me. And uh, oh, yeah. first of all, I want to say thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Um, I don't always get a chance to be on the same panel with Greg, but we do a few things together, and it's all right to me, so I'm glad to be part of this. Um, you know, it's interesting when you talk about the, the mediums that we, we choose. I kind of feel like for me, I chose me at a very early age. I remember at the age of seven, wanting to be on the radio. Not quite thinking it was in VR, but I grew up in St. Louis, and my dad was in the Cardinals baseball games uh, with an announcer by the name of Jack Buck, which I'm sure some of you may know of. And so, I fell in love with the radio. I fell in love with the art of storytelling, which again, at that young age, I didn't know what it was. Then as I got older, I just, I enjoy listening to people, listening to people tell their stories. And then as I got older, being able to, you know, give a platform to those voices and those communities that we don't hear a lot of, that we don't hear a lot from. And my career was in sports broadcasting. But then once I, I started working on a public radio station, I realized this was this is what I was missing. This is what I really wanted to do. So what I like about the public media platform, and particularly public radio, is that we are able to go beyond sound bites and sound clips. You know, um, as a journalist, and being able to tell stories through a feature uh, is always nice. You know, three minutes in radio is a long time. Imagine 18 to 20 minutes one on one with someone, mainly me, um, you know, talking to people about uh, their origin stories or talking to elected officials about their policies or just talking to an eight year old boy and his brother about why they started a lemonade stand. You know, it's storytelling for me. And I think that as a journalist, I enjoy the aspect of bringing storytelling at the intersection of, of you know, what it means to be a journalist. And I think you can do both. So that's kind of where I am with my media and working in public radio. I do, I do think it's changing. I think public media is changing. Uh, and I'm glad to be a part, still a part of it when, when it is changing. So for me, that's kind of how I feel about my platform that I have. 
Thanks, Rose. Uh, Greg, would you want to take that? Ooh, since Rose started talking about her origin story, I get to do the same. And it involves this guy. and involves <laughs> Professor Schiffman. I don't think he even knew until recently what a profound role he had in me becoming a journalist because when I was in fourth grade, um, the AJC's beat writer covering the Braves came to my class and encouraged, and I don't remember what he said, but whatever it, whatever it was, I went home and told my mom, I wanna be a Braves beat writer, I wanna cover the Braves one day. And my mom said, well, you gotta learn how to type. And I said, ah, never mind. I wanna do something easier, I'll be a doctor. So up until about <laughs> the age of probably around 15, I wanted to be a doctor. And, um, but I always, in the back of my mind thought, mm, this, this whole science thing isn't really for me. Um, well, I was over, I was best friends with his daughter, Jessica Schiffman, at North Springs High School. And I was always at their house. I was at your house a lot. I was just hanging out. We were um, watching TV or something on a Tuesday night, and Professor Schiffman comes, he was working at CNN at the time, and he came, he had just gotten a phone call saying it was basically an all hands on deck scenario at CNN. And he said, uh, we're, we're going to CNN, do you guys want to come with me? And Jessica kind of rolled her eyes and Dad, you know, don't annoy us. And I said, let's do it. And we went to CNN. And it was in the middle of a breaking news event. It was uh, 1998, and there was bombings in Kosovo, and at the time they thought it would be this big international conflict. And again, I think you brought us to the control room or somewhere. I don't know what happened there, but whatever it was, I was transfixed. I wanted to become a reporter. Um, I knew it probably wasn't going to be a TV guy. Um, I liked writing, and I liked, um, I liked words um, more than I liked being on TV, but I immediately went back, joined the North Springs High School newspaper within the few, next few weeks. When I went to the University of Georgia, one of the first things I did was I joined the Red and Black, which was an independent student newspaper um, that was a daily publication at the time, and I just plunged headfirst into it and, and really, um, started working on Deadline, and um, ended up becoming the editor-in-chief of the Red and Black, um, but got involved on a daily basis, got my you know, elbows deep into copy and, and, and dealing with breaking news and dealing with controversies at UGA's campus, um, uh, ticking off the, the school president, ticking off the SGA president, who's now running for US Senate, which is another weird story, um, and getting to know a lot, of, um, a lot of people who I still cover these days. I mean, the bizarre thing was when I was at UGA, my editorial advisor was named Kate Carter. Her husband, Jason Carter, ran for governor in 2014. Um, my high school teacher's husband was the, was the head of the, Democrat, uh, the Republican Party of Georgia. Um, people I was in class with were, were lawmakers and um, involved in politics at all different levels, and still are. Um, and, and one of the things I was fortunate enough to learn was that even though you have a grounding in, in print journalism these days, um, whatever you do, whether it's TV, radio, print, you're doing it all. And so these days, you know, we have a newsletter, I have a blog, there's podcasts, there's radio shows. Uh, I'm on GPB tomorrow for an hour long radio show. So you've got to be, in TV of course, so you've got to be up and skilled and ready to do anything. Um, print is still my first love. But these days, as a, as a journalist, you're pretty much, pretty much in every field, you're multimedia. And that, that speaks to what's changing in, in our business. Uh, so Richard, you want to take it so from here? I didn't think that journalism was going to be any kind of long-term thing for me. I had immigrated from the UK. I had no money. I was in college. I had to pay my way through school, started working uh, in campus radio, which paid a little bit of money. and. The wire service UPI, which the was arch rival. A, the arch rival of the AP, now gone. Um, uh, it paid me a stipend that paid my rent and paid for. So I worked as a journalist and telling people stories. It was fun, and in particular, radio caught my interest because you heard people telling their stories. Just to, to Rose's point, right? You, you get to hear their voice. You get to hear the emotion in their voice. It was one thing to write it in a wire story. It's another thing to hear it. Well, um, I was really having a great time doing this journalism thing, and I, I wasn't going to class anymore. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. It was bad. It was a bad outcome. I never graduated. 
Uh, and then I uh, was covering Jimmy Carter in Eastern North Carolina, and uh, it was on tobacco. Jimmy Carter was telling the North Carolina tobacco farmers, look guys, I've got this new health education and welfare secretary, Joseph Califano, and short story is, look, we're going to be cutting out smoking, we're going to be discouraging smoking, you guys need to find a new crop, just like I did with cotton when the boll weevil came along, I planted peanuts to make a living, you're gonna to have to do the same thing, and they booed the hell out of them. I've got my scoop for Greensboro, big tobacco manufacturing city. I, get, I go to a phone booth, I plug in my cassette recorder <laughs> with alligator clips and make a collect call. Remember, I was the news director there then. So I knew my deputy was going to answer the phone and I'd be on the air with my report. And the operator, collect call from uh, uh, Richard Gr Griffiths. Uh, with something about Jimmy Carter and the general manager had picked up the phone happened to be in on this Saturday morning we're not going to accept a collect call not on that <laughs> what I had driven across the state to cover this story remember telephone calls cost a lot of money in trust state uh, in the 70s you know it was like ten dollars to make a 30-minute phone call to That's upload like a your story. Now, right? Yeah, I mean, it was like a ton of money, and he refused. So I, there was must have been some mistake. He didn't. So I placed another, put in another dime in the pay machine, and call back, and again, he refused to accept my collect call. So I called the all news station in Charlotte. They took my story right away. It was on the air, and I drove back to. Greensboro fuming my knuckles white <laughs> on the steering wheel and on Monday morning I went in to have a come to Jesus meeting with the general manager about not accepting my collect call he said we just don't need to hear from a person like that and I said well this is huge for the people of North Carolina they, they need to hear what he's saying now we they don't need to hear that and so I quit and the same day, I was hired as a front desk clerk at a Howard Johnson's motor inn in Greensboro where I was paid twice as much. Wow. And my <laughs> lucky break was that a reporter from one of the television stations came in to do a news conference with the mayor and saw the mayor bantering with me at the counter. And the news director called me and offered me a job. And that's how I got into television. And television, I realized, oh my god. Audio, emotion in audio, but now you can show people things. And that was an awesome moment. And then I went on to work in various local stations and, and then started working for CBS around the world. And at that point, it was just awesome because you would parachute into a place and had to understand it and depict the remarkable things that were happening in those places and be able to carry those images back and convey that, that was just a rush, a hell of a rush. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, for our next question, a recent study by the Carl Vincent Institute of Government at the University of Georgia showed that Georgians are far behind on national averages in trust of the media. How do we get people to be media literate in this age? So I'll start with Rose. Good. <laughs> How do we get people to be media literate in this space that we're in? Yes. Um, get rid of social media. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, that's a great question. And I've actually, um, I've actually led discussions about the art of being a consumer of news. You know, we're, we're in a space now, and I know Rich and Greg can attest to that. Is well, we're up against social media. I always tell people, you know, look, understand the difference between news media and social media, incredible news media, incredible news outlets. So, look, we're, social media isn't going anywhere, but it's, us, it's up to us, those credible news outlets, then to use social media to educate people. Um, I'm not going to stop anyone from listening to 
their Uncle John, who all of a sudden has become an expert as an epidemiologist or in foreign affairs, right? Because when, when news hits the airwaves, everybody becomes an expert in whatever that issue is. But it is up to us as journalists to continue to drive home that understand this, our job is to disseminate accurate information. And if there's something out there that is not, it is our duty, it is what I.B. Well said. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. It is our duty, it is the number one tentacle of being a journalist to make sure that we do disseminate information that is accurate. And if there is information that's being that, that's out there that's not accurate, we have, we have to bring accountability to it. And so I always say we need to do a better job of educating people about being consumers of news. I tell people all the time, I don't care if you listen to NPR or CNN, I only listen to the AJC, I only watch back Fox News, but also do take your own, all the energy you put into going on Facebook and Twitter and reposting something that you don't even know is true, take that energy and then do your own research. If you don't believe what I say or what Greg Prince, okay, then take the time then to do your research. And don't go to your cousin Sarah's blog, because Sarah's not anybody's journalist. If you're going to do that, then really put in the time and the energy to really do your own fact check. That's what I can tell people. Because no matter what this day and age, with the way social media is, and the way things are, are, are transferred from one person to the next, to this platform, we're always going to have that. So we have to do our due diligence to make sure that whatever medium we have, whether it's with Greg and, and AJC, or whether it's with CNN, we have to make sure we're disseminating the information and we're encouraging people, you know what? Then do your own fact check if you don't believe. And also, it's okay to listen to other credible news outlets. I start my morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, I listen to the BBC. I listen to the NPR. I read the AJC. I watch CNN. There are some outlets I, I will not listen to or watch because they're not credible. And the information they're disseminating is not credible. It's just point blank and period. It has nothing to do with me being a black woman or a, it has to do with those organizations that I know are really credible news outlets. And we have to drive that home to people how they need to become good stewards and, and, and become credible consumer, consumers of news. We have to keep doing that. It gets tiring. I'm sure Greg gets a lot of crazy emails from people. But whenever I get something like that, I take, I answer every email. Oh, you're so much better every than me. Every email that I get that is crazy and is disseminating something that they heard from another outlet that's not even credible, I set them straight. I do that. That's the best that I can do. And that's all I can do. Great. Thank you. Greg? Wow, you're so much better than me answering <laughs> all those emails. Um, <laughs> A uh, first thing is, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, everyone in this room is a journalist in a way because you all have social media feeds, whether it's TikTok, it's Instagram, it's Facebook, it's Twitter, whatever. And you've, some of you have thousands of followers. Some of you can amplify that message uh, to thousands of people. Um, and so you have that, that role too, whether you know it. Um, my daughter's TikTok page probably reaches more people than, you know, than the red and black did when I was first starting. Uh, at the newspaper. Um, so it, it is, it is uh, kind of baffling to think about it that way. Um, I was in Texas last night with Stacey Abrams. She's starting a national tour, and I wanted to be there for the, for the, for the first stop of it, in part to write a story about what she's doing, like when she's going to run for governor, if she's going to run for governor, what kind of clues she was going to drop while she was there. Um, and a lot of that conversation actually revolved around the media. Um, it was a conversation with a local TV anchor in San Antonio, and um, one of the questions that came up was essentially, it was awkward for the, for the anchor to ask that, but what can the media do better? And sometimes Stacy is very critical of, of the way she's been covered, and this night was no ex exception. And one of the things she said that stuck with me was that every day her media diet includes sources that you never expect her to read. Um, of course, she watches MSNBC. She's she's a she's liberal. She's Democrat, um, you know. But that can be like an echo chamber. Um, and so what she does is that she makes sure she reads sources, oftentimes about her own self. Right? She's reading vile, despicable things about her, but it helps give her a sense of what people on the other side of the political spectrum are saying and doing. 
And her advice to the crowd of whatever it was, 2,000 that night, last night, was to do the same, was to, was to give your sense. You don't have to live and breathe it. You don't have to necessarily believe it either. But to read a broad spectrum of outlets so you have a sense of what the entire news sphere is doing. And I try to do that myself um, with my Twitter feed, with, with my local, you know, with, my, with what I read locally in Atlanta and, and throughout Georgia, and also with the national outlets I read. Um, from New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Um, I'll, I'll go to Breitbart and conservative outlets to see what they're, what they're cluing in on um, because it plays a major role in what I cover too, in a sense, because um, I don't want to be caught off guard at the next big far-right Republican theme that comes up because they'll, they'll suddenly come up and become major factors in the Senate race or the governor's race or whatever I'm covering that day. So um, I take that advice to heart when it comes to also building trust with your audience, one other thing she said, which, you know, as a reporter, you try to stay neutral, you don't clap, but I couldn't help but kind of snap in approval. One of the things that Stacey Abrams said last night was don't share, don't amplify, don't, don't promote, even if, you, even if you think you're correcting the record, don't promote lies. Um, if, if there is a lie, if there's a falsehood, if there's some sort of thing on social media and you want to you bat it down and say this isn't true because X, Y, Z. The point she and so many other media experts are, are, are I'm not saying she's a media expert, but the point she and, and others, including many media experts, are making is that that just sort of reinforces that, 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 that lie um, to, to the audience. Even if you're batting it down, because people will still see it and remember that you're the one who promoted it and just associate it with you, even if you're saying this is completely false. There's other ways to do that, there's, and we can get into that, but there's other ways to try to counter the false narratives that are out there. And unfortunately, in our line of work, that's becoming more and more important. I mean, I didn't think going into this past election cycle, I'd spend so much time trying to rebut falsehoods about how Georgia's elections run, right? Um, but that ended up becoming the dominant theme of from November you know, 6th on to January 5th um, was writing about the uh, Georgia's election and repeating the same phrase over and over. Georgia's election <laughs> has been upheld in three separate tallies and no courts or any bipartisan election officials have found any evidence of widespread voting fraud. I wrote that, that a variation of that phrase and still do just about every day. I thought you had that on an automatic. Yeah, you, you start just, typing the first three words and you get two graphs. You just press control <laughs> X and Z at the same time and it just shows up. But pretty much, right? And so many other reporters are, are doing that um, because there's a huge segment of the population, uh, a significant segment of the, of, of, of the electorate that feels uh, that there is widespread voting fraud despite all the evidence contrary. And so that is one of our challenges today and we haven't quite figured it out. Richard? So one of the things I do is teach at universities a lot. So my soundbite on this topic is actually a semester long. <laughs> but uh, I, I have a PowerPoint. And if you could pull up slide 10, slide 10 of the PowerPoint, I will distill my semester long class into about a minute and a half. Slide 10, if you go down. There it is. That's the one. OK, so I'm going to take, I agree with what Rose and Blue has said here a little bit about uh, the public's perception of what you need to do to judge news organizations. I'm now going to critique news organizations about what they need to do to build your trust. Right. Uh, we've got to make clear what our editorial uh, values and standards are. How do we do what we do and what are the values that we bring to that equation? Um, how can you figure those things out from our website or our TV channel? Where, where are you seeing those things? What's the difference between reporting and opinion? Now, for all of us on this panel, uh, uh, Rose uh, in doing her show and, and Blue when he's doing uh, guest appearances, 
some of the times he's reporting and some of the times he's giving his perspective on things. Same thing with uh, the CNN anchors that you, you see. Where is the dividing line between what we are reporting and what our opinion is of the news? And we're not doing enough, in my view, to make clear that distinction. And it's hurting our industry, big time. Uh, how many here has taken a calculus class uh, this semester? Uh, scary thing in the exam, right? You're writing all those formula in. You ever get partial credit when you get through because you make a math error, but you still get the formulas right? Well, some of the professors are kinder than others, but uh, <laughs> the point is showing your work to the public allows them to evaluate the work you've done. They may not like the finished product, but if you've shown them how you got to that place, you will build their trust. A competitor of CNN never ever acknowledges their errors or mistakes on air unless they're facing a lawsuit. Never, they never ever do it. But when CNN makes a mistake on the air and they correct it on the air, that other channel always makes a big deal about the correction that CNN did. Evaluate news organizations and think through, if they're being public about a correction, that means they have standards that they're upholding and they're holding themselves to that standard and being willing to embarrass themselves because they made a mistake. When you're having a date, or maybe in a relationship, do you dump the guy or gal that never makes a mistake? Of course you do. The ones that acknowledge their mistakes and apologize to you, those are the ones you want to be in a serious relationship with. It's the same thing in journalism. Uh, we are spending way too much time in big cities uh, as journalists. Major news organizations are based in New York, Washington, Atlanta, LA, some in Chicago, but it's the big cities there's no major bureau for the New York Times in Milledgeville. News organizations need to get out and turn over rocks and see what's going on in towns like Milledgeville. We need to listen more, as J.D. Vance puts it. Now, J.D. Vance is running for office now, but if whatever you think about him and his book, he has a, made a key point that we need to be listening to parts of America that we hadn't been listening to properly. And, you know, making sure, going back to the earlier point, making sure our reporting is error free, you gotta play error free ball as much as you can, but you also have to hold yourself to the same standards you hold governments and corporations to. And you need to be transparent about your work in holding those institutions. So that's my full semester condensed to probably a little more than a minute and a half, sorry. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to follow up on that, Richard, um, because that's, uh, you, you've made a very, very interesting point. And I wonder why you think, and I want to get opinions from Greg and from, from Rose as well, why you think the news media is not doing enough of those kinds of things that you just articulated? Well, you only have to look at the approval numbers for news organizations to see how much trust has been trashed over the last decade. And some of that has been driven by political forces who have deliberately attempted to undermine for their own ends. But some of it is self-inflicted wounds. We've made mistakes. Um, and we, we have to be much more transparent about how we deal with those mistakes, what those mistakes were, uh, and what we're doing to counter them. 
And some of them are really obvious mistakes. You know, when CNN had the tailwind scandal, it's ancient history for many people here, probably before you were born, some of you, it was a monumental screw up on the part of CNN's editorial mm -hmm. management. There was a deep dive into that process by lawyers and by distinguished journalists and a report written, and they changed the way that CNN ch uh, ed managed its editorial structure. That was an easy one to fix because it was a monumental, it was like a train wreck. It was all the wreckage was strewn for everybody to see. What is much more insidious is the subtle, tiny mistakes that happen again, day after day after day after day, that chip away at the foundations of our industry and uh, damage credibility with small, it's like the, the waves lapping uh, with the high tides on the sandbar, right? It gradually washes away the foundation. And we, we've got to do more to deal with that. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Greg? In, in the print media for generations, we had no real great way to measure who was reading what, right? You, you had newspaper sales and circulation, but you couldn't really pinpoint exactly why people were reading. You did surveys and things like that. But with the advent of digital media, you could suddenly know who was reading what, how long they were reading it, and what was generating traffic. And for us in, in that field, you know, some, some of those answers weren't great. Right, um, investigative stories that we might spend months, year working on, we're getting as much as many clicks as the story on the fire, uh, or the story on the celebrity uh, scandal in New York that we were picking up from the AP or from the wire service or from national. But, and so there was a reckoning um, for a lot of media outlets, and there was a lot of reporters and still are who who, who were required to by their management to to, to chase clicks, right? To, to go write whatever it was that, was that was getting the most traction online that day, even if they ad added no value to it. Um, and then there's outlets too that, that kind of focus more inward. Um, that's what we're hoping to do in a sense at places like the Atlanta Journal-Constitution where um, we know that there's a zillion publications who wrote about Trump's every move, right? I did, in 2016, I was getting millions of clicks by writing for a local audience what Trump was doing in, 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 in the presidential campaign. And at some point I realized, and my bosses realized, that we weren't really adding value to that conversation. Even if we were writing it through a Georgia lens, there were politicians here who were not getting nearly the same coverage, who had much more dramatic impact on our lives, governors and candidates for higher office and that like. Um, and so it's up to us in the local media to fill that role and to shine the light on what our local politicians are doing, but it's also up to readers. It's also up to the, the community to step up and subscribe to, to, to your local outlets that are dwindling, that are, that are, that are withering in some senses. Um, I always think of the Capitol in Georgia. Um, when I got to the, to the, the Associated Press Bureau of the, of the state capitol in 2005-ish, there were reporters from all over the state there, from Chattanooga even, from Jacksonville, Florida, who are covering Georgia politics from you know, their perspectives, from South Georgia or from North Georgia perspective. Uh, Augusta and Savannah and Athens had a three-person bureau at the Capitol writing state news from that perspective. Um, Macon and Columbus had reporters there. Atlanta had a big contingent of, of reporters. And within ten, uh, five, six, seven, eight years later, that had dwindled down to just a handful of reporters um, covering stories. I was breaking news on what was happening in Savannah and uh, Augusta, and I remember writing a story about a new bio, um, a, a bio security facility, a big deal in Augusta, and I wrote that it was going to be built on the banks of the Augusta River, and I immediately got all these people <laughs> writing, well, there's no such thing, what are you doing? And, you know, that's one of those things a local reporter would know that's the Savannah River, not the Augusta River, and I should have known better too. But it was, one of the, it was a reminder to me, I shouldn't have been breaking that story. I should write that story. It's a valid story for the AJC to write. But I shouldn't have been the one breaking that story. There was no one from the Augusta outlets that had any sort of connection to what was happening at the Capitol. So I was the one who found out about that story and broke it. And you know, things have gotten a little bit better at the Capitol. There, there are now, there's not now an intense interest. 
Um, and so there's more lo Atlanta-based media outlets that are covering statewide news, mo pretty much all digital. Um, but at the same time, you're seeing those local papers. They're retrenching, and some of them are starting to, 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 to hire strategically now. Um, but still, you're seeing a lot of those local papers really struggle. And without those papers, and without your commu the community support to those papers, um, and this is, you know, you've heard this a million times in, in our field, but you don't have that coverage of what's happening in the school council, the school board meetings, and the city council meetings, and the, the commission meetings, and all that, that lead to those national stories sometimes as well, that, that people like me kind of piggyback on sometimes. Um, but that is the instrumental ground level work. And look, when I go home, I live in Dunwoody, I religiously read, we have a, we, we're lucky enough to have multiple publications in my little suburb, but I religiously read them because I want to know what, what's happening at the, the city council down the road. I want to know what's happening at the cab commission. I want to know what restaurant's going up. And you know, there's growing news deserts where without community support, you're going to have fewer and fewer reporters. And, and it's be becoming afraid. harder and harder to get that support in those communities. Yeah. I've been working with the Clayton Crescent, yeah. which is a tiny one-person newsroom in Clayton County, Georgia. Uh, it, it includes the airport. It's 400,000 people live in that county. That's more than Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And there's only one reporter covering all of county government. And we can't get the money to keep that thing going without having to grovel and beg and we're right on the edge and a, and a quick story about that outlet robin robin kemp robin kemp um she's the uh, she's the editor and reporter for that outlet if you remember when georgia flipped november it was like the thursday friday morning after the election we all saw georgia's flip coming but we were all waiting to see um, the, the ballot counting and it came down to Clayton County. And there was one reporter in the Clayton County Elections Registration Office watching and reporting on the, the, the ballot counting as it was happening. And literally, like, God knows how many people, including me, were up at 4 a.m. in the morning watching Robin's Twitter feed to see if, if, if enough Democratic votes had come in to officially put Joe Biden over the top of Donald Trump for the first time the state has flipped since 1982. And it was Robin as the only reporter, a few reporters kind of caught wind of it and tried to get down there in time. But Robin was the reporter on the ground there. And there's, she, is, she is the Clayton County news source. You know, there's one person. That's the role that, that just one person can play now. Yeah, I, I know we want to come back to that yeah. subject, but I want to get Rose into the conversation. Because I think you're, you're, you're both Richard and, and Greg have been referring, kind of referencing com the commercial pressures that the, the news media is under. Uh, I'm wondering, Rose, how does that work at, at uh, an NPR station? You know, it, it's interesting because I think that people think, you know, there's always this perception of public radio, of NPR, the NPR listener. And, you know, when I started WABE back in 2007, one of the things I said was that y'all have to understand that Everybody that listens to NPR doesn't have this, you know, advanced degrees. It was always this kind of perception of NPR list listeners being kind of, you know, highbrow. And my challenge with them was that, look, you know, you need, you all need to make an effort to reach everybody. You know, ratings and radio and on the commercial side, because I've worked on the commercial side, and how those ratings drive, they drive everything from your salary, <laughs> you know, to the type, of, the type of time slots you might get if you are a, a, a news host or whatever. And when I came over to public radio and I realized that ratings weren't such a big deal, you know, yeah, we, we love being up there with the WSBs and, and being pro free if we can, but our ratings don't drive the type of content that we are, are, are disseminating. Um, do we look at it? Of course, we want to see how we measure up against the commercial stations, and we have another, we have two other NPR outlets in the in the market, but we don't really consider them sort of competition. There's WCLK, and then there's the WRAS, which is the GPB uh, affiliate. So for me, it was great to not have to know that the ratings were going to be driving, you know, the type of content that I was going to be covering. So there's that. But also, I think that when it comes to 
are you presenting the information that your listeners want to hear that's compelling? I challenge my producers every day with, look, if there's a story that NPR is covering, the first thing you should say, well, can we localize this to the Atlanta region, to the 13 counties? You know, because it doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm of the mindset of, I don't want to cover everything that everybody else is covering. Now, granted, a major cheating scandal at APS, everybody's covering that. There was a time where it was just me and I think Christina from the AJC that were going to every school board meeting. And it wasn't until the Blue Ribbon Commission came out with their report, or, and, you know, Sonny Purdue said, hey, and Nathan Deal did say, you know, we have to investigate this. There was nobody that was going to all those school board meetings. There was just a handful of reporters. But then as that story grew, and I remember, and I'll never forget this, the New York Times blasted, Greg, I don't know if you I, I do. Blasted WABE yeah. and the AJC for not understanding how to read a report that really vindicated then superintendent, the late uh, Dr. Beverly Hall. Basically, the New York Times said that our reporting was wrong. This is another outlet, and I remember I was jogging around Chastain Park, and I got a call from my general manager and the news director at the time that said, do you stand by your reporting? I said, absolutely, and I expect you all to stand by me as well. <laughs> and, and you were so vindicated. Later, when the state had their own probe and pretty much said the same thing that we had been saying, did the New York Times issue an apology? No. So for me, local does matter. Local it absolutely matters because Greg can tell you, you know, a story grows and someone comes from the outside and the day that those educators were being indicted, and I remember I was at a press conference and there was a reporter from somewhere and the reporter said, now which one's the superintendent? Which one? I'm like, what? <laughs> You know, so local does matter. But here, and in, in, in going back to your question in terms of public radio, we may not have to really be concerned about ratings and, and clicks, but I think now because we're digital as well, we pay attention to it. We pay attention to how we write the headlines. There was a time where I never worried about headlines. But now that all these newfangled digital editors that are like, Rose, your headline has to be catchy. And you know, it has to be you know, because the, the algorithm with Google and all the search engines, I'm like, I don't want to hear all that. I'm old school. I'm going to give you a headline, and if you don't want to use it, that's on you. But I realize that I am old school, as they tell me, so I have to get into that. But for me, it's like, you know, I, I can't let clicks and, and whether or not someone's going to pick us up, I can't let that decide whether or not I'm going to cover something. If it's important to the community, particularly with what I'm doing with Closer Look, I'm going to do it. I have no other choice. That's what I'm here for. So, you know, I, I realize with clicks, because that can turn into money and all that stuff, but I, I have to be driven by what is really important to the community and what is compelling reporting and compelling engaging conversation. And I, I look at it from the lens of if I'm sitting in someone's living room, what questions would they want me to ask of this individual? I, I interviewed Ben Chestnut, the CEO and co-founder of MailChimp a few hours ago. And you know, I got two different emails. He's a I'm very rich man now, right? I'm sorry? He's a very rich man now, isn't he? Yes, he is. Um, I got one email that said, you're a little bit too tough on him. And I got another email that said, thank you for asking him about the, the employees. Because I ask questions that I figure everybody else would want to know. That's my job. MailChimp may not, MailChimp being acquired by Intuit may not be a big deal in, in Oklahoma, but it's a big deal here in Atlanta, Georgia. And that's, that's the angle I'm coming from. I can't be concerned about ratings and clicks. Um, I've been there for 13 years now, so I, I guess they're happy with what I'm doing. <laughs> if you ever get to the point where they're looking at clicks and the I don't know, I guess I'm in trouble, huh, Greg? <laughs> Rose, I sense a tension between giving people what they want, but also showing people what they need. And I imagine, mm -hmm. that's a, I imagine that's a tension that a lot of journalists feel, whether they're in print or on television or, or on the radio. 
Onaga referenced a, a study. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at Rose. Onaga referenced um, a study earlier from the Carl Vinson Institute of Government that said that we are in Georgia um, among the states in the country the least likely to trust the media, trust the news media, and engage with news media. But we rank sixth nationally in our willingness to sound off on political issues. Uh, so if I'm interpreting that correctly, and maybe making a little bit of a logical leap here, um, what it suggests to me is that we are often engaging in very ill-informed or misinformed political discourse. Um, and I wonder, what is the, assuming I'm interpreting that correctly, um, what can journalists do to bring more reason to, political, to the political debate? Let's, and, and maybe I put that to Rose, but I'd love to hear from, from Richard and, and Greg as well. I like you going first. <laughs> what can we do? You know, I, I for me, and, and the only way that I can, can answer that honestly is that I hope that people know when we bring on guests, and this is what I charge my producers with as well, we have to be very diverse in, in the voices that we bring on the air and the voices that we hear from. I, I hope that when people know that I reach out and I'm doing a story about the, the rural part of Georgia or the plight of rural hospitals, um, I did a segment with a farmer in the rural part of Georgia about the pandemic, and he was a blueberry farmer. And people responded to that. You know, why is it broke Scott in Atlanta talking to this blueberry farmer in this rural part of Georgia? Because you know what, I wouldn't know how he was doing how you got through the pandemic. And he also gave me a great blueberry crunch recipe at the end of the day. <laughs> but I would hope that the audience knows that we're not just we're not just a show about Atlanta. We're you know, we're a show for everyone. And so for me, I think if we can show as journalists that we're not just covering urban Atlanta and that we're not just covering, you know, a certain demographic. I, someone said to me in an email one time, all you ever talk about is politics, race, poverty, and education. <laughs> and I'm like, well, <laughs> that's in the news, you know? But I'm also letting people know that, you know, what the face of poverty looks like around the corner for me in Old Fourth Ward neighborhood and what it looks like in the southern part of Georgia, what it looks like in Albany, Georgia, are two different things, or what it looks like in Gwinnett. So we're going to cover all that, and I hope that people know, and I hope that what they do is they look at that through this lens of, okay, I see what WABE is doing. They're covering as much as they can. They're not, I'm not just focusing on a certain demographic or just Atlanta. We go around the state as best we can. We've been hitting the, the, the pandemic hard. Why? Because this is a story. And I want to know how this is affecting everybody from the border to Tennessee down to Florida and all parts in between. So I hope that people recognize that as WWE and Culture Look doing the best that we can to bring you all those stories in between. We're not just focusing on a particular demographic. I'm not just focusing on black people. I'm not just focusing on women. I'm focusing on everybody. And also to know that we just don't drop in on a community when something bad happens. I tell my producers all the time, we should be covering more of the Hispanic and Latino community. We should be covering more of the LGBT community. We should be covering more of our Asian American Pacific Islanders residents. Not just dropping in when there's something bad, but not just dropping in when there is another police involved shooting of, of a person of color. You know, we have an opportunity to cover a lot. And I think if people continue to see that we're doing that, I hope that it gives them a little bit of sense of, of confidence in, in, in what we're doing and that we're not one sided. You know? and, and um, now, the thing is, and Greg will tell you this I, I'm not going to keep covering too much nonsense. <laughs> the election was not stolen, point blank and period. I don't need to have 50 segments about why the election yeah. was not stolen. At some point, I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? We can't keep feeding into that. Mm -hmm. I, we, have that we, we, have, we have to take a stand at some point. And I'd like to hear I don't ask people of color, hold on a second. 
I don't ask people of color, I don't ask black people how they feel about racism. Mm -hmm. That's not for black people to, feel, to, to figure out. I don't have that conversation anymore. Yeah. Doesn't make sense to me. And I'd like to ask uh, Richard if you would weigh in here too, having to make editorial decisions along the lines of what Rose is describing. Well, I, I, I want to back up a little bit. Um, you know, the good old days really weren't always the good old days, mm -hmm. but there was always, there was the uh, implied tension when I was working for CBS News that you were providing a product to local television stations that had a license from the government to make money over the public airwaves. And so there was a, uh, a quid pro quo that journalism would pay for I Love Lucy, Friends reruns, and The Gong Show, right? And it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, and it, that, that the public got something back for the gift of those airwaves in, in public service reporting of some kinds. Well, all of that has gone away with deregulation of the industry. Um, it was never there in newspapers, but even newspapers' ownership was very often driven by ego, very often family-owned, as it still is in Atlanta, which is probably why it has survived in Atlanta, as it has. There was uh, a certain ego when you go to the Kiwanis Club and somebody comes up to you and says, that newspaper you're running, it's just BS. Well, it's holding you accountable for what, you, you know, there's that joy of ownership that was part of it. And then there was the, the, the uh, tension that occurred uh, that allowed the public to see what was happening through a relatively limited number of lenses. And that was one of the problems, right? Because there wasn't that many people like Rose Scott mm -hmm. on the air. Right? There were a lot of people that looked like me. There weren't a lot of gay people on the air. There, weren't, uh, there wasn't a broad number of voices. So, yes, the good old days were great in that you had a driver that forced institutions to invest in journalism, but the investment was a very narrow investment. Now we have a broad perspective from huge numbers of voices, but we haven't yet figured out all the mechanisms for paying for all of this stuff. That's where the tension is. Rose is in a particularly good position. She's working for an institution that has a solid financial history in Atlanta and intense loyalship, lo uh, loyalty uh, among the listenership. In so many parts of the state, that does not exist. Does that answer yes. where you were going? And I, I will say I'd like to open up this discussion to our students here, uh, to our guests here as well. Um, so we would love to hear uh, from, from you all what questions perhaps you have for one of our, one of our presenters. If you will, just raise your hand and, and state your question, um, and I'll, I will call on you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. So okay, so wait a minute. That great question that came awesome. from the student who did not want to <laughs> be here question. earlier. <laughs> so he was honest. So, yeah. So let's let's repeat the question for um, our guests who are, are watching us online. Uh, and, and correct me if this is wrong, but um, how do we ensure accountability in in journalism? Correct um, uh, among practitioners. Well, I, I, that question is clearly being directed at me. I think the, <laughs> yeah. the accountability piece is... It's actually directed at Jim. But <laughs> <laughs> the accountability piece is all about you responding in you know, social media or whatever mechanism by calling up the state. You, you know, when I was working in television, if we got a couple of phone calls a day or a letter a week, it was a big deal. Now, 
every story has 400 comments underneath it uh, in, in, in the uh, response. Uh, to, so that's uh, thoughtful responses in that setting is really good. Uh, when there's a screw up on the part of a reporter, if you are pleasant to that reporter and not an unpleasant person and you send them an email because let's face it, most reporters' emails are now on their, uh, right underneath the byline. Yeah. And if you send, uh, hey, is reading your story, um, I wasn't sure about this, where did you get that? Here's what I understand, did I misunderstand that? Uh, your reporter is gonna look at that, oh my God, I screwed up on that. And you're gonna get a pleasant response and likely that story's gonna get corrected pretty quickly. Uh, so that feedback loop is very, very real. Accountability uh, is, is a great thing. And 95% reporters would go, you know, wake up in the middle of the night worried that they screwed something up in their story, right? Mm -hmm. Especially before smartphones, where you know, early on in my career, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have these kind of night terrors, like, did I misspell someone's name? And I wouldn't be able to figure that out until I got into the office the next day, because mm -hmm. you couldn't even access those stories, or unless you saw it in the newspaper the next day. Uh, where now, of course, you have instantaneous, so I can make a, a change. I literally made a change on the flight, Stacey Abrams folks had a minor issue with the story that I wrote in the morning, and they, I made the change to the story on my, you know, whatever, 10,000 feet above Oklahoma this morning. Um, so, so that stuff happens all the time, but it's also incumbent on us to be re receptive and reactive to that. We've gotta show our work, stealing from your slide earlier, we've gotta show our work, we've gotta be transparent, we've gotta be open to criticism, um, but there is a point, too. Like, I'm not responding, I'm not as cool as Rose. I'm not responding to all the emails that you just have these long screeds about X, Y, Z being, you know, Trump being reinstated tomorrow, whatever it is. Um, and frankly, too, that also bleeds into our role in today's media climate, like Trump's coming to town this weekend. Um, there are serious questions about, of course, I'll be there. I'm the political reporter for the biggest news outlet in the state. Like, I've got to be when the former president is there. I have no qualms about that. But we also have a debate internally about how to play it. Do we put it on the front page? Do we send new news alerts? Do we um, cover you know, broad, broad strokes of what he's saying? Or do we cover the minutia? Do we do a blow by blow, like he, now he's saying this, like we would do if he was still in office? Um, so there's all sorts of debates that we're still figuring out. I think national outlets are still figuring out the same things of how to deal with this, with this very unique media uh, realm we're in. Uh, you just won what I Ooh, give to my students, a pencil of excellence. <laughs> <laughs> Don't it spend a, it all is a place. prize to which I have uh, invested almost no money, but you can have it later. <laughs> so come afterwards and get your pencil of excellence. Yes. <laughs> what other questions do we have from you all here? Um, please raise your hand, share questions with you, with us. What other questions do we have? Make us squirm. There you yeah, go. yeah. Go ahead. Can I go to I one of my slides? A pencil. Uh, yeah, there's a pencil. Well, uh, yes, uh, Jacob uh, can show us a uh, slide here. four. So, and, and while we're doing that, the question is about trust. Uh, it's a two part question. Um, how can journalists sort of uh, um, ensure, I guess, that we trust them, but also what can we do as citizens? Um, slide maybe. four. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. There you go. Uh, I think this is what you're alluding to, is where we are seen right now. This is from the Edelman Trust Barometer from this year. It has an incredible 
a survey base of, uh, I think, 20,000 or, or more uh, respondees. So it's huge. It's 0.6 uh, margin of error, 0.6, which is phenomenal for a, a global survey. Look where government is trusted right there and seen as both incompetent and unethical. So negative 34, negative 10. Look where media is, minus 19, minus 3. We are not a whole lot better off than government, where government is. Business uh, is seen as ethical and competent, which is pretty remarkable as somebody, <laughs> f you know, when, when you think about it. So people would much rather trust Delta Airlines or McDonald's than they would the newspaper or their government. Cool. Uh, NGOs, they're seen as ethical but incompetent. So charities are seen as ethical but incompetent at doing what they do. I think that that is a real insight into where we are as a society right now. So how do we move media back over where business is and build back that trust? Well, you saw my slide earlier on some of those things, but I, I I think it, it, it is a micro thing. It is what uh, uh, Blue and, and, and Rose are doing every day and every show and everything. And then it's in a macro thing about what we're doing as an industry on a large scale to respond to uh, openness and trust by explaining our processes. It's not just the story, but it's the box beside the story. We got the story by a tip that came in to our tip line, and one of our interns went down there to look, and we looked under the bridge, and we found 400 homeless people cooking with gas on a pipe that had been cut into, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's explaining that process of how we get the story each step of the way. We may I, I want to see Rose, so it, it, you know, everybody's got... Uh, thank you. <laughs> we <laughs> maybe have time for one last question uh, from you all. Yes, Olivia? So I find it interesting during Constitution Week that we're here and uh, outlining the First Amendment of the Constitution and the right to free speech, the right to the freedom of the press. So I mean, in the society that we live in, there's certainly in the uh, lack of ability in terms of making it in journalism, but something that we discussed a lot tonight is majoritarianism and how it's taking effect in journalism and how you see these large corporations and, and big cities suddenly having a massive presence of media and being the only ones in your ear, and smaller voices, mm -hmm. you know, grassroots, startups, uh, local organizations are suddenly being cast to the wayside. So my question is not just, you know, I mean, would you like to say support local business? Well, right now it's the, and, and that is a great question. question, a great observation, and another pencil of excellence. So three <laughs> given away so I need far. To get some pencils. Uh, you don't get, you're never going to get one. Uh, what you're talking about is institutional change because those small news organizations, the ones that cover Milledgeville, the ones that cover Clayton County, there's no advertising to support them any anymore. So we've got to figure out new means of supporting them. And the experiment that's going on in Clayton County is trying to steal a page out of Rose Scott's WABE by coming up with a membership model. And that's not working. There's not enough of a critical mass. There's not enough wealthy people who are willing to write a big check for what's it. So we have to really rethink how we do that. And it may be that we have to do what they're thinking about in Europe, which is imposing some sort of tax on the social media platforms and the big technical companies in order to funnel that money to small newsrooms to support the kind of things that holds government accountable. How weird is that? <laughs> that you have to tax large corporations in order for small entities to be able to do the work of holding the government that's doing the taxing accountable. Uh, that's pretty radical, but it may be one of the mechanisms that ends up working in some parts of the world. And I think real quick too, it's incumbent upon the bigger media outlets 
in Georgia's case, the AJC, but nationally, like the New York Times is of the world, to partner with those local media outlets. You're seeing some of that already, but look, when the New York Times is following a story that the AJC wrote, they should link to the AJC story. When we're following a story that the Savannah Morning News wrote, we should link to the Savannah Morning News site. And to their credit, they are doing, the Washington Post is doing some They're of doing that They're doing a much work. better job. Yeah. But we're also seeing partnerships now. GPB does a great job of that. They're partnering with local media outlets. Uh, there's, a, there's a former AJC reporter named Andy Miller who left the paper and started something called Georgia Health News. And this was years ago, but now it's the super, you know, he's always done a great job, but now he's even more in the spotlight because he's writing about, he's this health expert who's writing all this very in-depth pandemic reporting. Um, and so GPB partners with him and so does the AJC. We're hiring a partnership editor right now who is trying to look for outlets to partner with so that, and there's some really great outlets, you have to go find them, right? But there's some really, there's something called Canopy that's focusing on, uh, on, on underserved, undercovered uh, uh, neighborhoods in, in Atlanta that barely get any media attention. And we're partnering at the AJC with, with national organizations and we just hired two reporters who only cover um, minority communities that we routinely didn't cover in the past. Uh, and we've got to do a better job at that at the AJC. But I think that's one of the many answers that we can do is having the bigger guys partner with smaller outlets. In, in some ways, what you're talking about is the model that CNN had starting in 1980, which is to partner with television stations and news organizations all around the US and then all around the world, where CNN would pull in their content and then share out that contract, mm -hmm. that affiliate relationship, which was the business model that allowed CNN to get going. And, and let's hear from Rose. Rose, what does it look like for us to show support to local local news sources and local media? I think it's key. I think everything that, that Greg and Richard have said is key. You know, today in, in talking about the story, you know, I gave attribution to the caterers.com, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which is to talk about a one band band, he's got a few people, but Dan Wisenhunt, who is stuck with the caterers.com because he covers all things to cab. You know, partnerships are key, and now we're in this space and this movement of, of solutions-oriented journalism, and we're in the space of, of focusing in on, on maybe one or two quality of life issues. That's what we, that's what we try to do at Closer Look, too. We, we look at those tentacles tied to quality of life, health and wellness, education, transit and mobility, housing, you know, education. Yeah. That, I, I think, is the future. You know, and, and since we're on this this movement of, of, of local matters, we need to partner with those smaller, independently owned news outlets. And I point to the caterish, I'm excited with what's happening with uh, Blue Canopy and there's uh, uh, some other ones out there. There's enough news to go around. I mean, I know we're all, in a sense, competitors, but partnerships really is key. That's just mm -hmm. the future of it. I really believe that. I, I, and I, I know that AJC is going to be giving away some socks pretty soon, but that's all because of public radio, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> To, to, uh, Rose, I, I just want to respond to one thing you said. You, 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 you did something marvelous, which is to give credit to Decatur-ish, right? But that's not really going to make any meaningful dis difference in their financial model. Maybe a few clicks, maybe a, a, a few things, and over time it might help a little bit. What we need right now for institutions like Decatur-ish are financial relationships mm -hmm between the larger institutions like Google and Facebook and the New York Times and CNN and the AJC and those appropriate places that actually drive sufficient resources out there to fund actual reporting and actual work. Uh, and yes, we should be giving credit and, and kudos to you for doing that, but it, I think it needs to go further than that. And I'm afraid we're out of time, but what I'd like to do by way of wrap up is to ask each of you in no more than one sentence aside from the folks here today who are the journalists you most admire and most like to follow and I ask that because of course we want to learn about your interests but also who should these students you know read from or, or listen from uh, Rose we'll put that to you first uh, aside from uh, these folks here who do you most admire who do you most like to read or to follow or to listen to well, for me, it, all, it, it does start with the, the journalists of the yesteryear, 
Um, you know, I, I, I've read a lot about and, and watched a lot of old footage of, of Edward R. Murrow. Um, I've read a lot about Ida B. Wells. I grew up watching 60 Minutes. Um, I was a big Mike Wallace fan. Um, and then when I, for me, who has been the model for what, we, for what I have to do, because let's be really clear too, now I'm making sure um, I'm a woman of color and there are gonna be angles and lens that I, that I cover that I think um, maybe I have a little bit better mm -hmm. platform and, and, and sort of the approach to because I am a woman of color. I do not believe in being objective. I believe in being fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My job is to be fair because sometimes in a story there is no objectivity. Mm -hmm. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And I don't need to give the, the wrong side of the story airtime yeah. when we know it's wrong. So for me, you know, when I quote is that template for me that I strive to, to be, and then there's some people that I, you know, I, I love reading great stuff. I really do, I mean, I know I, I was joking about I really enjoy Right. And before the was Jim Galloway, so I read other people as well. The chief Jim Galloway. Thank, thank you, Rose. Uh, Greg? Um, the late, great Conrad Fink. You guys are so lucky at here at school to have a great journalism department. At UGA, we had a great journalism, we have a great journalism department as well. Um, and uh, Conrad Fink was my mentor. He was a former Associated Press uh, uh, reporter and editor, covered wars and domestic issues and all sorts of things and took me under his wing as he did so many other students and is another reason, along with Professor Schiffman, of why I'm in journalism today. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Richard? So back when I was thinking about a career in journalism after I kind of got started to do it, I, I really started to admire the work of Carl Bernstein. Carl Bernstein was one of the guy, Woodward and Bernstein, who investigated Watergate and he was only 12 years older than me. He'd only been out of college eight years when he brought down the Nixon White House. Wow. Right? So he was, a, he was a young guy. And so I, I really admired him and, and I just thought that was terrific. At the end of my CNN career, in the final six months, uh, I was called to the secure conference room by the president of the network and you know all the big shots are coming in the president of international and up on the conference bridge they had the Washington bureau chief and and the head of the legal department and I thought, this is a really big deal and in front of us was an envelope and it had confidential in in one inch high letters in red printed diagonally across it and uh, and Jeff Zucker the president of the network said well I've, I'm sorry to interrupt everybody but this is really important some of you may recognize the person who is with me and I, said, I know that guy where do I know that guy from yeah this is Carl Bernstein and Carl Bernstein has brought us a document we need to evaluate and it was the Russian dossier that he uh -huh. had obtained wow. And of course, we did never publish that dossier, but for the next six months, I ended up editing The Man Who Was My Hero. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most remarkable six months of my professional career to wrap it up. And we got some reporting out of it. Uh, and ultimately, so much of it led to dead ends. Uh, but he is a person who I really admire, and he liked some of the questions I asked. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, he cool. likes me. Well, great. Well, we want to thank cool. uh, thank our three guests as well as our moderators um, for a wonderful discussion. Likewise, I want to thank you, our our audience, uh, both online and here this evening. Um, we, um, I encourage you to continue um, to, you know, to follow these, some of these questions that we've looked at and remind you again to activate your free subscription to the New York Times provided by Georgia College. I uh, likewise look forward to seeing you at our next USRI Forum, which is October 19th. We'll be hosting Dr. Dana Winters, who's the Executive Director of the Fred Rogers Center for Early Learning and Children's Media. With that said, um, to our guests here, thank you, and uh, likewise to, uh, to our panelists, thank you as well. Wish you a good evening. Thank you, Rose. If you got a red pencil.